God trusted you with your trial because he knew, like he knew when he allowed Satan to test Job, that not only could you handle it, but you wouldn't turn away from him. And there is someone out there who needs to see the evidence that you not only survived, but you thrived. Hello everyone, welcome back to 828 with Kate. Happy Wednesday. I hope you're all having a wonderful week, but if you're not, then I am especially happy that you're here, and I hope that perhaps this episode will give you the boost that you need today. I have a big topic for you guys today. This question I'm about to address repeatedly seems to come up any time that I share my story or talk about my traumatic experiences, people will say to me, well, if God is real and he is supposedly a loving God, why would he let you go through all those things in the first place? I have a sneaking suspicion that when people ask me that, they're not really asking about my life. They're asking about theirs. They want to know why they have been through so much pain and so much heartache. Perhaps if you are a non-believer, that is what is preventing you from believing in a loving God. Or if you are a believer, maybe your current trials are causing your faith to waver. For some reason, as Christians, we can be hesitant to admit that we have doubts. But I, for one, understand the questioning. When someone close to you passes away, or you yourself are struggling with sickness in your body, you have been begging God to heal you, and yet healing doesn't come. Or maybe you have found yourself in the depths of a breakup or a divorce that you didn't see coming, In those moments, it can be hard not to question how a God who is loving and just could let you go through pain like that. While I was preparing for this message last night, I started to think maybe I should have tackled a slightly lighter question (laughs) because I am not a theologian or a Bible scholar. I certainly do not have all the answers to this one. However, for some reason, it has been heavy on my heart to at least share how I have made sense of the things I have been through. When I have been going through trials, they have pushed me to seek God more and to scour my Bible for answers. So if anything that God has revealed to me can also be helpful to you, then I will feel like I have done my job. So let's get into it. Firstly, we have to debunk this idea that if God is real, then everything should be perfect. This idea is not biblical. Assuming God is real, and he wrote this book for us so that we could know him and have a guide for our lives, we have to look at what he says about this. Unfortunately, nowhere in this entire book does God say we won't have a rough go of things here on earth. In fact, Jesus basically promises us that we will. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. And if you're a Christian, you may be hit with it worse. He says to believers, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. He also said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. In other words, this is to be expected. If God himself came into the world and it treated him the way it did, what makes us think that we are going to have things any easier? 
it is true that when God first created the world, it was blissful. It was what we dream of. Genesis talks about the Garden of Eden being filled with beautiful trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. It was a place of total provision. You were not worrying about how to pay bills or make rent in the garden. Adam and Eve had everything that they could possibly need, but best of all, they could be with God, their creator. Genesis 3, 8 says the Lord was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve could be with him and converse with him. It was also originally a place of innocence. They were naked but unashamed. There seemed to be nothing that would cause them a sense of anxiety or fear of evil. They could be at ease. Sadly, this is no longer the case for us. Our world today is riddled with fear and anxiety. I don't know about you, but I have a sense of anxiety in my body every single day. People now drink alcohol, they abuse drugs, they try any number of things just to get back to that feeling of ease that I imagine we once had in the garden. And the reason that this is no longer our reality is that sin and Satan entered the world. We cannot blame everything that happens to us on God, especially when he says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one and that Satan is now the God of this world. That is not to say that Satan is the ultimate authority. He is not. His power is limited, restricted, and temporary, but he has power nonetheless. So if you are angry about what's happening in your life or in your surroundings, make sure you are pointing the finger at the right person. Satan is the one who comes only to steal, kill, and destroy everything in your life. That is his mission. That is his purpose. Whereas Jesus says, my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. Now you might say, well, who made Satan God of this world? And the bad news is that in a way we did, or at least Adam and Eve did. After God had created this beautiful world that he himself is king of, he created humans in his image to be his representatives. He entrusted us to rule his world on his behalf, kind of like vice kings. I am blown away when I think about the dignity and the authority that God has given us, far beyond anything that we deserve. In Psalm 8, it says, He made us only a little lower than the angels and crowned us with glory and honor. He gave us charge over everything he made, putting all things under our authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. However, in Genesis chapter 3, we see that instead of Adam and Eve harnessing all of the potential of God's creation and building it into an even more beautiful world, they chose to rebel against God and essentially handed over the keys of the kingdom of this world to Satan, subjecting it to his rule. So that in 2024, most people are now following him, the God of this world. They are continuing to live in sin and separation from the one true God, who is the source of contentment, joy, peace. You wonder why people are so confused and so unhappy these days. It's because 
they are separated from their source, from their creator. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So people are now walking around in the dark. I was reading that the phrase God of this world, or some translations say the God of this age, indicates that Satan is the major influence on the ideals, opinions, goals, hopes, and views of the majority of people. The thoughts, ideas, speculations, and false religions of the world are under his control and have sprung from his lies and deceptions. So this is the first reason that we cannot blame everything that happens on God. Sin and Satan are at work in this world. But your next question might be, if God is still more powerful than Satan, which he is, and God is the ultimate authority, why doesn't he just get rid of Satan? And he is going to. In Revelation 20.10, it says that God is eventually going to throw Satan into the lake of fire. But for the time being, God, in his infinite wisdom, has allowed Satan to operate within the boundaries that God has set for him. I heard John Piper explain it like this. He said, God has ordained that Satan have a long leash with God holding on to it, because he knows that when we walk in and out of those temptations, struggling both with the physical and moral effects that they bring, more of God's glory will shine in that battle than if he took Satan out yesterday. The glory of God and Christ shines more brightly when we are seen to be supremely satisfied in Christ in spite of Satan's torments, rather than if we had his torments removed and liked Jesus because of it. And I have to be honest with you, when I first started looking into this, I felt like, God, I still don't get it. You could get rid of Satan like this, but you don't. Is it really necessary that we keep him around for however much longer? And maybe you're listening, and maybe you won't admit it, but maybe you're thinking the same thing. Maybe disagreeing with how God is choosing to manage the devil. But whenever I find myself thinking that maybe my idea is better. <laughs> I am reminded of what God said to Job. In Job chapter 38, after Job has gone through horrific suffering, he has not lost his faith in God, but he is questioning God on whether he is just. Job demanded a full explanation from God for his suffering. And what God asked of Job is for him to trust his wisdom and his character. I'm going to read some of Job chapter 38 for you, and, and I challenge you to read this if ever you are doubting God or um, thinking that maybe you know how he could do things a little bit better. This is what the Lord said to Job. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions, surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it, on what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone, while the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy? Have you ever given orders to the morning, or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea? Have the gates of death been shown to you? 
Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me, if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light, and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born, you have lived so many years. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons, or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? When I read this passage, I feel put in my place. In the best way, though. It reminds me that sometimes we just have to trust that God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He is infinitely wiser than we are, and he knows what he is doing. He knows what he is doing with Satan. He knows what he is doing with us. And he knows what he is doing when he allows trials in our life. We should find rest in the fact that he is in charge. Nothing happens that has not first passed through his hands. So, with that being said, let's talk about some of the reasons why God might permit you to go through hardship. Number one. Because God can turn evil for good. The difference between God and Satan is that God always has good purposes in mind for you. When Satan comes to test you, he only wants to tear you down, steal, kill, and destroy. With God, if he is letting you go through something, it's only because he knows something great can come out of it. Genesis 50.20 says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. This is especially true for those of us in ministry, which is actually all believers. We have all been given the Great Commission to go out into the world, preach the gospel, and make disciples. Wherever you have been called to, whether that is preaching on a stage, going every day to an office, or serving people in a restaurant. Wherever you are planted, that is currently your mission field. Now, there are fires in your life that you have gone through and come out on the other side, not even smelling like smoke, so that you could be a picture to someone else of God's provision, of God's protection. Not everyone would have gone through that same trial and still been praising God on the other side of it. There is a quote from my Bible commentary that says, Everyone cannot be trusted with suffering. All could not stand the fiery ordeal. They would speak rashly and complainingly. So the master has to select with careful scrutiny the branches which can stand the knife. God trusted you with your trial because he knew, like he knew when he allowed Satan to test Job, that not only could you handle it, but you wouldn't turn away from him. And there is someone out there who needs to see the evidence that you not only survived, but you thrived. Have you ever heard that quote? It says, you have been assigned this mountain 
to show others it can be moved. I am sure there are some of you who will only tune into this podcast because you grew up without a dad like I did, or you also have CPTSD, or you have been through abuse as well. You will listen to me talk about God rather than someone else because I understand what you've been through. In the same way, there are people who will only listen to you because of your specific testimony. I have the perfect example of this. Um, Back when I was the sole Christian in my family and I was desperately trying to get my mom to become a believer, I would sometimes put different sermons on the TV and try to get her to watch them with me. I tried every single pasta you could possibly think of, and she hated all of them. She would say she was bored, she didn't like their voice, um, she wanted to turn it off, she just, she didn't like any of them, until one day I put on a message by Joyce Meyer. When my mum heard Joyce speak about her upbringing, which very much mirrored her own. All of a sudden, she had ears to hear. She softened to hearing the truth of the gospel because she connected with this woman through a shared experience of pain. Now I catch my mom listening to Joyce Meyer all the time. But I can guarantee you this, if Joyce had not been through years and years of abuse that she endured as a child, my mom would have switched the TV off so fast, just like every other pasta. The Apostle Paul is also a great example of this. He wrote a letter to the Colossians from jail saying, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. He was able to see that his sufferings worked something good for others. He wrote again to the people of Philippi while he was imprisoned, saying, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. In 2 Corinthians, he says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. And then he goes on to say, All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Paul was explaining that his death-like trials made for a more effective and life-giving ministry. The second reason why God may be allowing you to go through a difficult season is because of what it produces in you. Trials expand faith just like exercise develops muscle. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 says your faith is growing more and more. I now have more faith because God has got me out of situations I couldn't get out of myself. I have more faith in God because he has provided for me in situations where I couldn't make ends meet. I talked in the last episode about how I believe my relationship with God the Father is so much deeper because my biological dad wasn't there while I was growing up. My mom has told me that her faith is so much deeper because of her experience going through breast cancer. In the book of James, it says, Consider it pure joy, 
my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God refines us in the fire. How much is your character developed when everything in your life is going well? How much wisdom do you gain when everything is simple and easy? This makes me think of one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite theologians. Um, His name is Charles Spurgeon. He was known as the Prince of Preachers, but he struggled his whole life with depression. And he said, I am afraid that all the grace I have got of my comfortable and easy times and happy hours might almost lie on a penny. But the good I have received from my sorrows and pains and griefs is altogether incalculable. Affliction is the best book in a minister's library. The third and final reason I am going to mention today is... Sometimes we are going through a situation and we are tempted to blame God, but it's actually us. Obviously, I am not talking about death, sickness, or situations we really have no control over. I am talking about when you are sobbing on the bathroom floor, going through a breakup, questioning God, why would you let me go through pain like this? But you never prayed in the first place before you got into that relationship. In some cases, we just have to take ownership of our mistakes. With our free will that God has given us, we don't always make choices that align with his will for our lives. I have found that sometimes we have to go through something because it's the wake-up call we need to get back into the will of God. A few years ago, I made a silly decision to move in with the guy I was dating at the time. I was in a tough spot financially. I was desperate to get out of my current living situation. He lived in another state to me, so we were doing long distance and I couldn't afford to move to his state without moving in with him. So I justified it to myself. I told myself, we're going to have two bedrooms, so, you know, we will be more like roommates. We will not be sleeping together. I was still saving myself for marriage, so I told myself, it's not sinful, We're just in the same house. We'll have separate rooms, separate bathrooms. But I still knew deep down, if I was honest with myself, that I was stepping out of God's will for my life. I wasn't waiting on God's best for me. I wasn't waiting for his peace and his approval to move forward. I was impatient, so I was rushing ahead And I was trying to fit God into my will instead of me submitting to his will. Long story short, I ended up in so much emotional turmoil in that relationship. I got burned, I got hurt, but the worst part of all was waking up every single day with no peace. There was not a single day in that relationship where I woke up in the morning and I didn't think I need to leave. God in his mercy made it so that I was so uncomfortable that I had to get out of there. And thank God that he did. Sometimes God is going to have to break your heart in order to save your soul. He will have to hurt you to heal you. In the book of Jonah, Jonah ran so far from God's plan for him that he ended up in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights, until eventually it says, from inside the fish, 
Jonah prayed to the Lord and called out for help. It took being inside of a whale to get Jonah to turn back to God, but God faithfully pulls him out of that situation, and my Dr. Tony Evans commentary says, the pit is not a bad place to be if it gets you back into the will of God. When a visit to that place is what it takes to nudge you back on track spiritually, you can thank God for the pit. We are going to end up in a lot of pits in this life. Whether ones we have dug for ourselves or ones we just happen to fall into. The life of a Christian on this side of eternity is one of longing and waiting to be without God while we endure the suffering that this life brings, but we do not have to go through it alone. Whereas if you are a non-believer, you are still going through the same suffering, but you are doing it alone and with no hope. And I don't know about you, but if I have the choice of going through the ups and downs of life alone and hopeless, or with a friend who promises to stick closer than a brother, I know which one I'm going to choose. If we turn to Jesus, he gives us peace in the present, hope for the future, and promises to be with us for the journey. As for right now, I still think we all have this deep, innate longing to go back to the garden. It's as if our bodies can sense that we weren't meant to bear the weight that we are carrying. The death, the sickness, the pain that we endure today. If you wake up some days and you just think, this all feels too much and too heavy, me too. And it makes sense because we were created for so much more than this. People write songs about wanting peace on earth and ending wars because, Christian or not, we all somehow know that this is not how things were supposed to be. The Bible even says the whole of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. As creation itself is frustrated because it's in bondage to death and decay. But in Revelation 21, we find out about a garden that is yet to come, which will be even greater than the original garden. I don't know about you, but I always used to think about the Garden of Eden as being perfection. But when I started studying it, I found that it can't have been completely perfect, given that Satan was still lurking around in it as a snake. But John tells us that this new garden will be completely safe and secure. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Satan will have been thrown into the lake of fire, never to be seen again, and for those of us who put our faith in Jesus, we will get to be with our Creator, walking in the garden with Him forever. It says, look, God's home is now among His people. He will live with them and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. What a life we have to look forward to. I hope this episode was an encouragement to you guys. If you have any questions or you would like to send me a message, you can do so by leaving me a comment on YouTube or you can send me a private DM on the 828 Women Instagram page. I check all of my messages there and I reply to everyone. So if you want to contact me, feel free to reach out. Um, if you are enjoying this podcast, please do 
consider leaving a rating and a review so that we can get this out to more people. Until next time, I hope you all have an amazing couple of weeks. I will see you not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. God bless you guys and I'll talk to you again soon.